Thank you very much uh, for participating, uh, Daniel. It's great to talk to you. It's been a couple of years since you did the um, MSc in Technology Enhanced Learning. And it's great to see you moving on to other things, to using it as a springboard to launch other aspects of your career. Um, mm. So um, I'm really looking forward to hearing about um, how you've used models um, to inform what you do as a learning technologist. So I'll leave it to over to you because I know you're going to introduce yourself in more detail. Um, yeah, so thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Liz, and thanks for the invitation. Um, so as it says there, this webinar is about uh, models to help design and deliver digital learning. So excuse the PDF for uh, Red Trouble with uh, trying to get my PowerPoint to work. So I just have to scroll through this. So this is the overview of the webinar. So I'll give a better introduction to myself in a few moments. Uh, the focus of the webinar, I'm mean, just going to some taste of some models. Um, but I'll introduce to yourself, or you might be quite familiar already. Uh, so just a little bit about myself. Um, so I'm broadly defined as a digital learning specialist, um, learning technologist basically. Um, but I started out in uh, further education as a learning technologist. I'm now in HE as a digital practice advisor at Nottingham Trent University. Um, and I focus more specifically on consulting with uh, schools and teams and on trying to identify their digital literacy sort of needs um, and creating and developing uh, staff development opportunities basically. I'm a qualified teacher, assessor, leading teller verifier, uh, and as I just said a couple years ago, so a few years actually now, um, I did the Technology and Learning MSc at the University of Huddersfield. Um, I'm a certified member of the Association for Learning Technology, and I went on to win the Learning Technology of the Year Award in 2016. Um, outside my full-time work, I'm a consultant, writer, author and an external quality show for digital skills and digital learning design qualifications. Um, and just as part of our consulting sort of work with the uh, Education and Training Foundation, I've recently um, been invited to like write and review the enhanced modules as well as the essential digital skills modules. All right, so just moving on to the focus kind of thing with um, the webinar. So Liz has told me that um, you're interested in the issues of designing, learning, using technology. Um, I've only got half an hour, but um, yeah, just kind of broadly some of the challenges and issues and constraints with digital learning. So um, I kind of like grouped them up really in the areas of like pedagogical, technological, creative and communicative, because I feel like it's around uh, those areas. Um, I'll get to more context side in a few moments, but you might experience this yourselves uh, in your roles when you're designing digital learning, but it often comes around to uh, time, um, cost or associated costs, availability of resources, equipment and people, so that's resources um, you've got available or not available within your organisations, so that could be content as well, the equipment, so that's like... Um, devices or gadgets or whatever that you need to help make this digital learning. And people, obviously they're like resources themselves, but you might need um, specialists or subject uh, matter experts, you know, the staff basically involved in the creation of that digital learning. And the, the dreaded one, the technical reliability, which often comes down to access and compatibility. So access in terms of like if it's websites or um, just generally some new learning content within your virtual learning environment. Um, can you actually get into it? Can people actually get there and navigate through it? And compatibility, obviously, does it all work across um, the different browsers and operating systems? So digital divides, uh, that's the cultures. Uh, we've got access to um, internet and obviously technology itself. Um, yeah, just in general. Then we're going, going on to more like the personal side of things, which are digital skills, the accessibility and confidence side of things. Um, but just a little bit on the accessibility, it's not always about a disability itself, you know, um, there's a lot of features within technology these days where we can actually use them to support our own learning. So me, for example, I, I quite like subtitles on videos because it's not, not only am I just listening to what the person's saying, but I'm actually reading it as well, which helps me digest what's um, being said really. Um, yeah, confidence kind of gone through that, but yeah, uh, people confident, um, not confident, sorry, uh, comfortable, like yourselves, um, are you comfortable in using various uh, software and things uh, to create digital learning. 
But lastly, and um, this is what probably should, uh, should come first, really, is it needs analysis. Um, going on to the testing side of things, it's all about the why and, and why you're creating this digital learning in the first place. You know, is it replacing something? If so, uh, what were the issues with that originally? Um, is it better? Can it be better? <laughs> but yeah, it's really what are you designing this digital learning for? Which leads me on to the next question, which is what you're wanting to achieve, basically. And I kind of group this into some broad areas. So you might be thinking about improving blended learning or digital learning opportunities in general. So meaning that you, you've already got some stuff in place, you kind of want to make it a better um, initiative, sort of thing, or opportunity or activity as such. Uh, it could be a fully online course. As part of your programs, you might need an online element. Um, or it could be just creating e-learning activities in general. So maybe it's like um, individual specific things as part of your courses or your programs. As I say there, you know, digital learning is a very broad thing. Um, so it could be about blended approaches, individual e-learning objects slash activities, or you might know them as like e-learning packages sort of thing. Or it could be an online collaborative activity, um, again, which is part of an online program or could be an online program itself. So it's all about the context and what you um, wanted to design. So the following slides are just some models um, that can help you like design or even plan um, and generally like, deliver digital learning in a range of contexts. So like I say, it's a broad area, but hopefully these will go some way to help you get started. Um, and it's in the kind of style of, um, of my book, which is the Learn Technology Handbook uh, for FE and uh, Teachers and Assessors, which is also uh, useful for HE staff and prime school uh, professionals as well. So um, if anything uh, from this webinar, hopefully it can help you with your studies. It's just some models and other areas of practice can help you um, well, um, to investigate further afterwards. So this is from, well, it's all from the book really, but we all have um, run, obviously, in individual like, publications themselves. But this one specifically I kind of created for the book. Um, so it's called like, the Daddy Model. It's, it's quite familiar with the ID model for e-learning. It's very much that basically, but all I've done is put an extra D in front of it, which is the determined power, which you can see on the graphic at the top there. Because um, I feel like the, uh, those power determine, it's like um, we need to determine what, determine what it is before we start analysing something, if that makes sense. So as it says uh, on the the addressing part um, helps you to concentrate on the audience, you know, uh, who, what, why, when, where, and how, which makes you think about what, what's in your session plans, uh, even lesson plans, sorry, uh, yeah, your session plans and your lesson plans sort of stuff. Um, what is it you're trying to create, basically? But it's just a basically a good um, like cycle to help you organise and structure the learning content that you've got and, and the ways that you can make it online or want to make it online. So it's a um, to try a bit of a structure, really, uh, a production cycle. What it doesn't really give you is um, an indication of how long you should spend on each one, because it's again, it's a quite a broad sort of graphic, um, and well, so is the added one, really. But you would really spend a lot of time, or a majority of the time, on the analysis part, uh, which is the audience. So it's uh, designing for your learners and how um, you know what they meant to be learning. To be honest, um, out of that. But you will like systematically kind of go through each stage. So you're designing. So once you've like defined your audience, you're going to be design. Um, so like, you know planning what is what you're trying to achieve. So it could be e-learning object, it could be an online program sort of thing. You're going to developing that. So it could be some sort of like when I say prototype, but some sort of like um, mock example of something. Go through various stages of testing or whatever. And then obviously we implement that with your learners and then go to evaluate. So in essence, that's what it kind of is, just a bit of a cycle. So ways you can use that is, um, as I say there, analyze learning needs. So it's a good way just to really think or really get to, um, you know, narrow it down what is it you want to do or make it digital. Um, it helps you to identify what is taught or delivered digitally. So obviously some stuff, well, that comes down to being blended learning really, um, what you want to teach yourself, uh, what you want to make digital. Which I'll leave on to that uh, next one. Plan for blended learning or fully online uh, programs, and this has got strong links to learning design methodology, um, which is one of the areas that I'm actually not going to mention, but it is in the book. Um, so we'll check that out. 
Um, so let's go to the next one. So again, this has kind of got like strong links to uh, learning design, um, but it's kind of like focus on problems specifically what activities you want to create. But these are a lot of lads, um, six learning types, and I use this um, in my work quite a lot. It's like they're always in the back of my head uh, when I'm designing uh, digital learning of any kind. Um, so as I say there, I feel like it's a modern sort of, um, what's, the, what's the word I'm looking for, but instead of using a visual, auditory, or kinesthetic sort of debunk learning styles, I, I kind of find it um, a more um, better version than that really, or an improved one. So again, this is a, doesn't always have to be around digital, to be honest, it could be face-to-face -face, um, delivery. But there's some potential ways you can use this. So, the acquisition side of things would be um, reading, watching, and listening sort of stuff. So I'm suggesting you could probably, um, what does it say there, kind of focus on the interactive elements. So the animated diagrams, videos that's got like social bookmarking within it, um, or like talking heads sort of stuff. But again, like I said, you could put more interactive elements there that can have links in and stuff. Um, or it could make some, some sort of screencast of a tutorial of um, website, software, or whatever, uh, and provide a narrative on there. So discussion and communicative, um, that's about like, articulating ideas, questions, and such. Um, and you can do that through um, online forums, like synchronous or asynchronous forums. Um, but yeah, but obviously joining the discussions and such. Investigative, so that's like handling or finding handling and dealing with information. So I suppose social media can be used to its advantage um, for discovering new information and various hashtag sort of activities that can do with it. And again, with the social bookmarking. The practice and experiential, so that's got links to, um, as it says there, like theory to practice of applying learning into a work setting. So you could make use of simulations, games, virtual labs, role play sort of stuff within there. We don't have a collaborative, so as I mentioned just previously, you can create like e-learning objects or activities that might contain drag and drop, hotspots, things, live polling, I might use in some of the uh, um, sessions or lectures. And I'm saying that you could use like, Office 365 for online um, collaboration documents. I just made a suggestion there actually, it was on page 35 in my book, there's a good page where, or a couple of pages, where um, it's listing like the typical virtual learning environment activities that you might find, uh, so that could potentially be useful. And lastly, there's the productive um, learning type. So that's about putting um, not just yourself, obviously, but you know the learners creating like um, additional content themselves. So I'm not saying we're creating your own e-learning object or anything, but it could be. Um, I don't know, just some sort of digital artifact that could potentially go into a neat portfolio of some kind later on. But it's given to really look at, uh, use their digital skills and develop those as well within them. This one is a model that I put in my book as well, but I created that. So this is about, based on e-learning design, but emphasis on the word rapid here. Um, so obviously, as educators, you'll be um, very busy anyway, um, but obviously it's out of pressure that you've been expected to um, you know, create your own e-learning, which obviously brings a lot of um, uh, sorry, the requirement for new skills. And often enough, um, e-learning design kind of hangs on instructional design, but it's not just that you know, the theoretical side of things, it's um, learning the software as well. That. So this is something rapid here, so I'll just give a little bit of a quick framework where you would, like in a face-to-face -face sort of session, you provide some aims and objectives, what uh, learners will be intended to learn. Um, you might want to put a bit of an induction, introduction sort of slide in there. So I'll say a slide, so usually rapid either sort of object or package sort of thing, you would yeah, have a yeah, title sort of slide, introduction sort of slide, any links to any previous learning from previous session or whatever it's coming from or linking to. But on the... The next slide, now I want to have some like bite-sized sort of theory, or small chunks of information with a bit of interaction. So it could be drag and drop matching exercise or hotspot sort of thing um, within there. So, you know, learners or the users in general have got information to um, interact with, you know, emphasis on the doing. So not just passively watch, you know, watching or reading something. 
Um, but anyway, so the, yeah, the slides after that could be again back size view interaction. So a few more slides, so you've got a bit of knowledge there. And some like doing sort of stuff there or testing knowledge, and then again, you've got information and doing something again. So it just keeps um, you know, learners on the and challenged on what they're learning. You might want to put a sort of assessment in there. So what I'm saying that this kind of addresses with. So I'll just mention one particular tool that is really good is H5P, and there is a free aspect to it. Um, but what I'm saying it's going to like address is the time sort of side of things, obviously. Um, yeah, you shouldn't be expected. I know that's not always the case, but you shouldn't ex be expected to create new content from scratch all the time. So what I'm saying here is that, um, should be further down actually, so I'm trying a bit, but yeah, uh, well, availability of so software and the skills needed, because usually with e-learning offering software like Articulate and Adobe this sort of stuff, requires intensive training mm -hmm. and skill to use. So the point I was just going to make, but, um, yeah, so it should be like a, with this rapid side of stuff is using existing materials. So taking existing PowerPoints, for example, and then turning those into something a bit more interactive and it could be placed online. And it's the same there with the statics element. I'm not saying all virtual learning environments are like this, but sometimes it can be off, uh, or often have a lot of, yeah, when I say static, like Word documents, PDFs, and PowerPoint sort of documents, which all have a place and they are valid. But emphasis on the, the learning path of the virtual learning environment is that uh, you should expect less to go there to learn something, do something. Daniel, uh, Dan, yeah? um, there's a question from Stephen about what um, H5P stands for. I don't think you've got to it yet, but uh, just wondered whether you want to pick that up now or wait for a moment. Um, yeah, I'll mention it now. It stands for uh, HTML5 package. Uh, so if you type in h5p.org, that's the free one. And basically, it's a very, um, uh, well, like everything, it comes with a, a learning curve, but it's very easy to use online e-learning software sort of tool. It's got examples on it, but if you go to a website, h5p.org, um, you'll see what it can do, and it's absolutely mind-blowing, to be honest, but <laughs> that's another thing. If you've got time at the end, I'll come back to that, but yeah, that's... Okay. That is, um, yeah. So, um, yeah, I'll move on because I've just noticed the time. I want some time for questions as well. There's a few more slides. Um, so, yeah, MC, so I'm using, so reusing your existing content and you shouldn't be expected like, to um, be creating that polished e learning sort of stuff, but um, yeah, using what you've got. But obviously, you know, do me, you know, aim to make it a little bit more appealing and stuff. But, you know, that's why learning technologists, e learning designers, um, it might be in your organisations because they're there to help you make know, these things. And I would obviously encourage like to um, look at instructional design sort of um, techniques because that can help you to present information a little bit more uh, better or um, in different ways really. All right, so this is the display engaged participation model. It's one that I developed a while back and again it's in the book in a little bit more detail. But this is, if you were um, if you think about using any learning technology um, itself, so it could be devices or just it could be um, think, you know, based on like e learning sort of stuff. Oops, something's back on this slide. Bear with me. I've just moved it. Oh, sorry, I just moved it so we could see the image a bit clear, bigger. Sorry, because I've magnified it on my side and it's just gone yeah, in a different oh, okay, direction. Sorry. Um, but just back. on that. Yeah, it's all right. But just on that, I'll send a link out afterwards uh, to you, Liz, you can share on um, yeah. students. Um, it's an article that I wrote earlier this year, and, and that graphic came from there. Uh, and I think it was okay, for teaching you. times, so I'll pass it on. But yeah, so this is just to help you to think about or reflect on how, um, you know, when using learning technology, maybe be more quite, kind of like passive with it or be more interactive. So you can like, not work through it systematically, but what you want to... What, Again, what do you want to achieve? So, are you using learning technology to display stuff, which is, um, yeah, students like viewing uh, documents or online information, or is it engaged where um, students would be like taking that information, um, but not, yeah, it would be purposing, it, but not kind of fully understanding the breadth and depth of it. And you would like more to participation where uh, that's where students would be taking that information and creating new knowledge from it and uh, applying it somewhere. But I've an annotated that with some learning technology tools and stuff. So, I'll, like I said, I'll send the link out um, so you can see those more clearly. But that's what it kind of does, just able to think a bit more interactive about it. 
This is quite a popular one, um, and I still use this a hell of a lot, and you might be familiar with it. Um, it's a Jilly Salmon's five-stage model and e-tivity invitation. So a five-stage model is based on like an online discussion sort of um, a approach. So you would, kind of, again, systematically kind of go through these stages, so can students um, access and navigate through what it is that you've put out there. So it could be learning content, or it could be an online program. Um, and you've got the online socialization aspects there, so we can talk to each other and exchange um, ideas, which is obviously the next one. So uh, making connections with each other, and like the knowledge instruction where we're building on each other's knowledge, and that's where you as an e-tutor uh, would come in and then make the connections between people and, uh, yeah, to conduct your sort of like tutoring role, but obviously online. And development leads on to uh, students becoming a bit more like independent, um, with navigating their online and online environment, all the content itself. In a nutshell, so for each of the invitation, you can't see it on there, but um, I'll also put a blog post out, um, including all this, so you can see it in more uh, clearer detail. But this is really good for designing online activities because it helps you to think about what's the purpose, what's the connection to the learning material, what resources you want to put in there, and how does it link to any of the future online activities that you might want to design. But overall, uh, all of these help with the st uh, structure uh, and design of uh, e-learning or digital learning that you wanted to design. It helps you to think of ways I can implement these within um, programs or it could be you know, institutions in general. So we're coming to the end now, so I'm just going to just, yeah, uh, some of these are the publications uh, these videos have come from, uh, you can see on there. And I'll just put some links to um, some previous bits and pieces of work for when I did my MSc and how I applied some of these concepts in there. So, um, yeah, I'll let you look at those in your own time. Uh, but a lot of these feature in the book, which you can see there, um, and obviously uh, written in a practical um, sort of style. Uh, so it's kind of a G-style thing, so I know I've kind of like rattled through that quite quickly, uh, but I want you to um, uh, think about some of those things that I've just been talking about and um, ask me any questions. So I think you might have been managing the thread uh, or chat feature, Liz. <laughs> yeah, okay. So thank you very much, Daniel. Um, that was a, you know, that's really interesting to see how those various theories um, help you in your practice and to know which ones make most sense to you. We've introduced particularly the, um, um, the um, uh, Jilly Salmon model in the class, so people should be familiar mm. with that. That's one that I find helpful. Um, it's interesting to see that you use Diana Lorillard too to, uh, as a way of understanding the types of uh, ways that students engage with e-learning. Um, um, I was, you know, I, I don't know about this H5P thing, so thank you for yeah. that. Um, I, I'd have a question on that, but let me see whether Matt and Stephen have got anything that they want to ask first. If you've got anything that you want to ask um, either of you, would you type it in? So I don't think we've got a response from them. So the things that I'm interested in, what what does that H5P what does it do? Uh, I heard you say, uh, what you said about it being an um, HTML-based. Um, is it a program? or to, What is it? What do you have to do and yeah. what does it give you? Yeah, I've actually got a separate blog post I'll send you out afterwards, which um, goes a bit more detail. Um, so basically, there's about 30 plus content types. When we say content types, there's like what you would expect, like drag and drop sort of thing, uh, different assessment types with uh, matching elements, text entry. Um, multiple choice sort of things but you've also got like um, it's called co course presentation which uh, well I'll come to that in a bit actually but it's like branching sort of um, content type where it's a bit like if you're quite familiar with articulate sort of stuff but it takes like down, down a different pathway so you've got a, I think the example of use on a website some sort of customer service sort of thing where they've got um, a video content based so there's a uh, person walking up to a door knocks on the door I think it's like some sort of social work sort of thing or setting so a person answers the door and then a question up on screen and saying okay. um, yeah so it gives them a choice saying how would you um, answer okay. this sort of thing or how would you deal with this situation 
to depend on what the answer, um, it'll take them down a different route. Um, so it creates learning artifacts and learning which you'd host on a VLE. Yeah. So does it produce, what, a zip file or HTML files? What does it produce? Yeah. Well, this is, this is the thing. So if, if you think of it like e-learning packages, it's like you're creating those, but kind of online. Um, so it's not like a file type um, okay. as such that you download and upload. So, um, yeah, so there's like individual content types, but the most popular one is it's called course presentation. And it's very much like in a, a PowerPoint sort of slide style thing where you've got some slides there, you put content on them. And you can um, include various content types in, including ones, well, not the branching one, but um, you can include the, the assessment sort of stuff like um, the drag and drop um, and the matching sort of stuff and the yeah, assessment sort of stuff. We can also include another content type, which is very popular, which is called interactive video. So you can like link to like YouTube videos, for example, or potentially lecture videos. And it adds a layer of interaction on top where the so video is playing, for example. I mean, you can put place markers on. Um, or disable skipping so you can't skip a long video. But yeah, when you come up, up, the output file, is it a link to a website that you then embed in the VLE? Yeah, yeah. so there was two different sides here. So yeah, it basically you would create this thing um, and then you would em take the embed code, like a YouTube video, and embed yeah. it into your, um, you know, your VLE. Mm -hmm. But on, on the payable... Yeah, on the payable version, which is, this is something I've been doing at the university and we finally got there, well, we're 95% there, where we're trying to Im implement the, um, the VLE integration. So basically, we'd create the content within the VLE and then just deploy it into your course, um, we call okay. learning rooms, but okay. so, so that So you wouldn't have to embed. I think there is an embedding element, but it depends on what VLE you're using. I mean, if it's okay. Moodle, then there's a, there's a really good plug-in where it just deploys that learning in there. Okay. Interesting. And Stephen, Stephen said, I've had a quick look, and it seems to be an add-on to an existing creation system. Um, so, so is that what, how you would understand it as an add-on, or, or is it, it sounded to me like it's a web-based service that gives you, like YouTube, you get end up with an embed code that you could then put in your mm. VLE. Yeah, like I said, there's two sides. The free one, the h5p.org, um, the, well, I think they've changed the word in it now, but um, they now encourage you to just use that as a bit of a testing area. So you can create content on there. It's not like fully secure because you can't make your, your content private, but it's not discoverable either. That's another thing. But um, right. yeah, so, so you can create the content on there and get the embed code, um, but you just mainly use it for like you know testing out content. But the H5P, is it the .com, that's like the payable uh, fee-based one where you would get the, an integration into your VLE. Um, but, yeah, it is like a, an add-on sort of thing. Um, so, yeah, it's something that you would, um, you know, like I said, integrate into existing uh, platforms that you've already got. Um, yeah, unless, you, you know, you don't work for a particular organisation, you're working alone sort of thing. Okay. Um, so there's some examples. I'm just going to look at that website while you're talking, and there are some examples um, to look at. What's one of the links? So I'm going to check that out myself. Um, so yeah, so it creates uh, yeah, can it create interactive elements that you can put into a VLE? That's right, isn't it? Yeah. Interactive elements that you can put into VLE. Yeah. That sounds good. Yeah. And this is what I was kind of like linking on to about rapid e-learning design. And this is how I've pitched it to Nottingham Trent University that, you know, emphasis on that rapid only. Because, you know, creating e-learning in general, you know, it's a skill itself really. But we focus on the rapid part where you're taking existing yeah. materials yeah. And, and we, you know, transform it through H5P. It, it's yeah. quite revolutionary. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm going to look into that. So thank you for that. That's a brilliant um, eye-opener uh, to some um, more tools that I didn't know and, um, refresher of some processes uh, for us and for everybody else. Um, any last questions before we, we finish, Matt or Stephen? Okay, I can see. Okay, so thank you very much, Daniel. It's been really interesting to hear your thoughts about um, designing for e-learning and the uh, in FE and HE.